it is my delight to share God's word with you, the amazing good news. Those of you who looked at the notice you may have received about the title, some of you may have had a little discussion about it at home. It's possible. And so let's see what we are. Is God fair? Is God fair? <laughs> we all grow up with a sense of fairness, don't we? When we were children and uh, mummy was dividing the chocolates, we made sure she did it properly, meaning it was equal. You gave more to him? No. We all have this inbuilt sense of fairness that is kind of developed within as we grow in our culture. And our culture influences the way we consider what is fair. If you were living 200 years ago, let's say in, in the US, and you were a person who owned slaves, you were a Christian, but you owned slaves. It was quite fair to treat them in a certain way. So even our sense of fairness is not perfect, even though we think we know what is being fair. And our sense of fairness is also instilled into our society, into the systems in our society. So we have Lady Justice. What is she holding usually? A balance. Because it has to be fair. Yeah. We want people to be treat, treating us without favoritism and without discrimination. And we think we also do it that way. So, while we all have our sense of fairness, and of course we all think we are fair, and sometimes we will say things like, in my humble opinion, right? SMS, I-M-H-O. <laughs> so, we think we are humble in, in our opinions. But is that right? Do we understand fairness? But one of the realities, friends, the hard, brutal truth is that life is painfully unfair. Life is unfair. While some couples get to experience the 50 years anniversary, and what a wonderful thing that is. But some couples don't get to enjoy even their five years of anniversary. Life is not fair. While some of us are born in privilege, others are born in poverty. While some are born in palaces, others are born in refugee camps. Some of us have parents, good parents, responsible parents. But others did not have parents to take care of them. Innocent people in our world are victimized and killed. And yet, you on the other hand see the wicked get away and prosper. None of us deserves the plenty that we have the benefits that we can think about. But neither do people deserve to be born in poverty and suffer. Well, friends, that's how life is. And we have to work with that painful reality. Life is not fair. But my question is, is God fair? I know you want to say yes. <laughs> Because we are worried. But if we make a calculation that life is unfair, and therefore God is not fair, it is because we are thinking that God controls everything. In fact, sometimes we say, don't worry, God is in control. It's a nice statement. But is it true? Does God control everything? Well, that's a different message altogether. We will talk about that maybe some other time. But is the God we have worshipped fair? Now, we don't have to go around defending God. You know, in this Old Testament, there is a long, big book called the Book of Job. 
and most of it is chapter after chapter these three friends of job you know what they are doing they are defending god then at the end of the the whole story god is doesn't need their defense in fact he's mad they are trying to defend god and job was the one don't just read one or two verses in the beginning of the chapter of job okay read the whole book job has many questions in one of those places you know what job is saying job is saying god you know what i am featherweight you are heavyweight it's not fair you come down to my side put on boxing gloves let's fight that's what job says to god and god is okay with that in other words we don't have to defend god but how do we know god where do we get reliable understanding knowledge about god where from where definitely not by the way many of us use the bible some random verses from here and there what about this what about that you know we all have including me i am still trying to cure myself of this disease we all have this disease you know what that i have given it a name called versitis take one verse and run with it that's the kind of verse you get on your whatsapp from your friends nice verses god is with you i love you there are many more other passages in the bible you don't get those on your whatsapp the fact is friends how do we know this god where are we going to get reliable some random story from here and there is that going to form our understanding of god thankfully we know where and how to get reliable understanding knowledge about god and that's in our lord jesus that's why the gospel writer john chapter 1 verse 18 john 1 18 what does he say john says no one has ever seen god are you say come on i thought moses saw god i thought isaiah saw god right no john is saying no i'm telling you no one has seen god not in the way we see now in jesus no one has ever seen god but the one and only son who is himself god and is in the bosom of the of the father as one translation is closest relationship with the father he has revealed god to us we can know god only through now reliably through the revelation we have in jesus jesus reveals what god is like and so when jesus comes through his life through his teaching through his actions through his parables we get to know what god is and what the kingdom of god is therefore we must focus to get a best understanding about god on the life of jesus the parables of jesus sometimes i am shocked that i have been in some meetings major meetings where the preacher is so energized a wonderful preacher happy to preach he picks up a passage from the old testament and he preaches his heart out he's sweating through the jacket you can see the sweat and then i come back and i'm taking notes and then i say hello he did not mention jesus anywhere he didn't come to a text in the new testament and there was a wonderful one hour sermon i think we will miss if we don't see the scriptures through jesus we read scripture as god's plan beginning with uh, creation and then from abraham and god's plan through israel and then jesus takes upon himself the role of israel and we see scripture through jesus through his life death resurrection and coming of the spirit today quickly i want to share with you two familiar parables one of them is more familiar to you than the others and we're going to read that quickly turn with me to the parable in luke 15 that we're going to read this is the parable of the prodigal yeah we like to say parable of the prodigal son to me just remind yourself these titles these chapter headings verses all this was put later on Luke does not call it the parable of the prodigal son neither does Jesus. Let's see what the story is all about. And when you read the scripture remember one thing that you need to read the scripture not verses. 
When you read a verse, make sure you read verses before, behind, whatever, so that you see the text in its context. Because the original writer did not divide it into chapters and verses. Got it? So as we look at Luke 15, look at the previous chapter in the last verse. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Do you see that connection? But if you start from 15 verse 1, you will not see that connection. When Jesus says, those who have ears to hear, who has ears? Tax collectors and sinners, the bad people. How come? Bad people understand the gospel. Look at the next verse. It says, but, <laughs> but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. They had a problem with Jesus. Tax collector sinners don't have a problem with Jesus. How come? This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. These are people who are holding the Bible all the time and they have a problem with Jesus. Why? Because they do not have a good understanding about God. Their understanding of God, their theology, their understanding of God is warped. We have inherited sometimes a warped theology, our understanding of God. And so Jesus says, then Jesus told them this parable. The two groups of people. And so he gives his parables and Luke has put three parables together for us. The first parable, we like to call it the parable of the lost sheep, don't we? In fact, some of our Bibles, mine says the parable of the lost sheep. That's what my Bible printed. Jesus never called it by any name. He just told a story and you have to think a little bit. The thing about the parables of Jesus, they pull you in. You think for yourself. And very often it doesn't say at the end, the parable or the moral of the story. No, you think for yourself. And the point of the story is not the sheep getting lost, but a shepherd who risks the 99 to go after the one. Because God is like that shepherd. It's not the parable of the lost sheep. It's the parable of the lost, of the seeking shepherd. The second parable is not the parable of the lost coin. It's a parable of a woman who searches till she finds that precious coin. God is like this and then we have a third parable. The well-known third parable which we have been calling the parable of the prodigal son, Ketta Kumaran, Budiyanaya Putra, Urau Putra. And that's not the point of the story. We miss the point. Look at chapter 15 verse 11. I'm going to read for you. Welcome to read. I'm going to read quickly read the whole story because maybe you have not read it recently. There was a man who had two sons. So it's not a parable of one son. Why do we call it parable of one son when there are two sons in the first line? The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Mm, that's a bit unexpected. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered, wasted his wealth in wild living. Although he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Remember, pigs are an unclean animal to Jewish people. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and have biryani. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Please note the story is not over yet. Because this is not the story of the prodigal son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look! All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because... This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is a story about a prodigal. But it's not the son alone that is a prodigal here. The word prodigal means what? You know, it comes from the Latin prodigium. Prodigium is something that is extraordinary, like a portent, which causes amazement. And that's why when we have a child who's extremely gifted, we call the child a prodigy. So, prodigal means too much, lavish, extravagant. That's what prodigal means. Yes, the younger son was a prodigal in the sense of he wasted extravagant living. Blew up the money, bab ka paisa. You know, that you don't have value for. Boom, it's gone. Yes, he was. But really the point of the story is not that son. You know, the father doesn't even say anything in the story to his, that son. He has to say a lot and plead with the other guy, whom we don't call the prodigal. And remember this guy who we call the prodigal kept saying, father, father, father. The other guy said, look. He didn't even respectfully address his father. So you decide who's the prodigal here. He sees himself as a slave, but he says, no, my son, everything I have. See, the, the second son wants his father to be fair. And the father says, son, I am not unfair. All I have is yours, so I'm not unfair. But don't ask me to be fair. Because this is not about a fair father. It's about a prodigal father. A father who lavishes mercy on undeserving ones. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 130, verse 3 and 4, Psalm 130, psalmist says, O Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who can stand? I can tell you, I cannot stand here. But with you, there is forgiveness. Therefore, we can serve you with reverence. With God, there is forgiveness. One of the greatest biblical scholars of all time, was a man called David Noel Friedman. He came from a Jewish background, but he became a follower of Jesus, and he was a great scholar, especially the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament writings, and many, many other uh, Hebrew writings that are there, uh, many, many other writings which we don't have in our scriptures. And one day somebody asked him, Dr. Friedman, how would you summarize all of these writings, the Hebrew writings? You know his answer? Very simple. He said, there is forgiveness. That was his summary of the whole Old Testament, what we read. A person who knows the Old Testament far better than any of us could ever read. That is the good news. 
the good news is god is not fair he is gracious he is compassionate he is merciful that is the good news but you know what religious people like me and you find it very difficult to believe that somehow we have like those pharisees and the teachers of the law developed a view about god that we find it difficult even though we sing amazing grace till we struggle with this god and let me tell you this many times in our cultures even cultures that are not necessarily connected to the church and the bible and the, in forms of art in songs and movies there are themes redemptive themes and acts of grace that stand out and one of those favorite stories of mine comes from the 19th century uh, during the time of the french revolution victor hugo he wrote this book very long book called les misérables and so there are some you know several movie versions of this because it's an amazing story and there are two important people in this story jean valjean he is an escaped convict you know he was put into prison for 20 years for a simple small act of robbing or stealing one loaf of bread to feed his sister's family he was put in jail for 20 years for robbing one loaf of bread and so when he comes out on parole he jumps parole now that is against the law sure and so there is one guy called inspector javier who's following him in that story my favorite film version is the one in from 1998 where liam neeson is jean valjean and he has a amazing experience in the home of a bishop some of you may have read about the bishop scandlesticks and that bishop in an act of unexpected grace he begins to show grace to him that he receives that changes his whole view of life completely transforms him but this inspector xavier is after him and finally at the end of the story it's a long story he arrests him but then he also knows how jean valjean has acted in mercy towards him so he doesn't know what to do and i won't tell you the end of the story in case you want to watch that or read that story at the end of the story he says it's a pity inspector xavier says it's a pity the rules don't allow me to be merciful the rules don't allow me to be merciful and he does something very interesting and i will not tell you what it is does friends god made the rules of justice and mercy and god took justice upon himself that's why apostle paul will say in second corinthians 5 god has reconciled the world to himself in christ jesus he takes justice on himself to reconcile the world that is the good news that is the good news there are no two sides to god's character he is just and he is loving no there's only one side love and but his love is a just love his mercy is a holy mercy so let's have quickly look at the second parable this may be a parable you have not looked at for a while so turn with me to matthew chapter 20 matthew 20 we're going to read this parable often called the parable of the workers in the vineyard Matthew chapter 20 and I'm reading for you it's a very interesting parable not as well known as the previous one for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and send them into his vineyard about 9 in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing he told them you also go and work in my vineyard and i will pay you whatever is right so they went he went out again about noon and about 3 in the afternoon and did the same thing about 5 in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around he asked them why have you been standing here all day doing nothing because no one has hired us they answered he said to them you also go 
and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, Call the workers, pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us and have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Very, very interesting. You see, we expect Jesus to always comfort us. Yes, when we are needing comfort, we are in pain, Jesus will comfort us. But other times when we are too comfortable, he will make us uncomfortable. The parables of Jesus were not made to the, so that we will have a nice, cute story. So the end of the day, you know, the parable is over. What do you learn from these children? I will go and help mommy in the kitchen. <laughs> is not as simple as that. The parables of Jesus very often pull you in and shake your entire universe. They have that potential. Because once you are face to face with the nature of God and the kingdom, it will change the way you look at life. See friends, this story is from the hard world of day laborers. Many of us may not experience, have experienced that. But we have seen in Bangalore, I'm sure you have seen bus loads or uh, truck loads of people who have this little yellow hat. They are going at work spots in the morning to work at these big building sites. And they build the houses for us which they can never even imagine or dream of living in. Hard world. Many times such people are exploited then and now. But that's the world Jesus picks his story from. And you have the story of a man who is the HR guy. He goes and brings workers in. 6 a.m., then he goes at 9 a.m. Now, come on. If you are planning to have a good harvest, you know how many workers you need. You plan well. You go and get them, right? Okay, maybe you didn't get the right amount at 6 a.m. Get them by 9 a.m. But this man is going at 12 noon, 3 p.m., 5 p.m. Come on. Not a very efficient manager. Maybe the point of the story is not about efficiency. It's about compassion. And everybody gets the unexpected one denarius. You see, if you did not get one denarius, which is the basic, basic requirement. Do you know what is a poverty line in India? Supposed to be $2.15 a day. So if you are earning about 200 rupees, okay? If you earn 200 rupees, you are not poor. If you earn less than 200, then you are poor. Some of us who earn quite a bit still think we are poor. Because we can't, you know, buy all the stuff that we wanted to. It's just basic survival. You can imagine how many million in India live below that poverty line. And now, if that master doesn't give that man at least that one denarius, that means his family is going to be hungry. This master is not about being fair. And so when that man remonstrates and argues, he says, Hello, my friend. Very interesting, in the Gospel of Matthew, only three times the word friend is used like this. Jesus uses that. And once he uses that to Judas, when he comes to betray him and he says, friend, 
What's your problem? Tell me. Didn't you agree for one denarius? I am not unfair. But don't ask me to be fair. I will do what I want with my money. Now what's your problem? Now when you read it in your translations, different translations have different words. Are you envious that I am generous, right? That's the word. Actually in the Greek it is, do you have an evil eye? Ophthalmos poneros, evil eye. Do you have an evil eye? Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, you have a very interesting passage. Matthew 6, quickly, verse 22. Matthew 6, 22, it says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. You will not learn this in medical school. Ophthalmology. This is a different way the eye is used as a metaphor. What is it used for? But if your eyes are unhealthy or evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I don't understand what's happening here. It's a metaphor we don't use this way, right? Evil eye. But as I just told you, the best way to understand the Bible is to read the Bible. Don't read verses. So look at the verse before that. Just read the verses before that. Matthew 6, 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven or with God. In the gospel of Matthew, he uses the word heaven for God. That's why you have kingdom of God. In the other gospels, Matthew says kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a way of saying God. Store up treasures with God where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It has to do, all has to do with money. How we handle money. The gospel is not, the gospel is about a God who is not fair. He's not unfair, but neither is he fair. Because God is good. <laughs> God is incredibly generous. God is good beyond compare. He's gracious. He's compassionate. And that goes beyond our so-called human understanding of fairness. Unfortunately, sometimes we, God's people, have a calculative bent of mind. We have a problem with this God who lavishes his mercy on undeserving people because somehow religious people begin to think that they are deserving. So the goodness that they are experiencing is because they worshipped or they were good or they were obedient or they gave their tithes or whatever. God's people have a problem with God. One of the best places to notice this is in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus goes into his own native place as we call it. He goes to the synagogue at Nazareth. And what does he do? He reads the scripture. When he reads the scripture, Luke chapter 4, oh, people say, wow, he's from our village. Wonderful. But Jesus says, verse 25, let me tell you something. There were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Many Israelite widows but God did not send the great prophet Elijah to one of, any one of them but to a pagan widow. Secondly, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Please note that Syria was the enemy of Israel. And so God chooses to use his great prophet Elisha to heal a leper, but who? The general of the army of your enemies. 
And what was the response of the people you can read? They were so furious, they took Jesus by force and took him to the brow of the hill to kill him, to throw him down. Jesus escaped. Why did God's people suddenly in the synagogue turn around? They could not handle that God loves his enemies. Especially God loves my enemies. See, some of us, along the way as we life goes on, some people become our enemies. And we have a problem if God loves them. And we say there must be some special place in hell for him or her. You know why Jesus says love your enemies to us who follow him? Because God loves his enemies. God will not ask you to love your enemies if he doesn't love his enemies. God is not fair. He is gracious. That's what Jesus came to reveal. That's what Jesus did on the cross. When they were doing the most horrific thing to him, he was hanging naked on the cross. That's the time he could have said, don't worry, a day will come, I'll show you who I am. No. He said, Father, forgive them. They were forgiven. Because God is not fair. He's not unfair, but he's gracious. And that's why one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 6. Look with me, Exodus 34, 6. Many times when I'm introduced, I'm scared. So I'm glad when people ask me, how should I introduce you? So I can tell them. Because yesterday somebody introduced me and said, I've written many books. And my wife still has to wait to see which book I have written. I've contributed to some writings, but I've not written a single book. Sometimes when we introduce each other, we get things wrong. But when God introduces himself, Exodus 34, 6, what does he say? This is how God introduces himself. If you don't introduce God this way, then you got God wrong. I'm, I'm talking still in the Old Testament, by the way. Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord. This is the Lord speaking to Moses. The first thing is, what's the first thing? Compassionate. Not fair, not holy, compassionate. What's the next one? Gracious. Next, slow to anger like us. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. God will also do justice. The primary aspect of God is that he is rakum, he is compassionate. Rakum, that Hebrew word comes from the word rahem. In Urdu you have the word rahem. It comes from the womb. God has a womb. He's like a compassionate mother. That's who God is. And if our understanding of God is not this, friends, we need to spin our heads around and put it in the right order. Because this is what God is like. Colossians 3.12 If God is not fair and he is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, what should we be? We who have stood and worshipped this God today, together with others, we are called to be like this. See what it says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. You're dearly loved. Clothe yourself with compassion. The first thing. I think at least a few of us, this morning we got up, we wondered which clothes to wear, right? Once in a while I'll ask my wife, is this okay? Because I don't know. Sometimes I, I don't have a great dress sense and all that. We look at and we prepare, right? Some of you ironed your clothes. Some of you are very well prepared. Yesterday itself, you ironed your clothes. Some of us did it this morning. Some of us didn't. Relaxed. We have many clothes in our closet. Some of us have so many clothes that we have not worn some of them for years. But let me say, this is what we need to have in our closet. These are the clothes we need to wear as God's people. Compassion. Kindness, 
humility, gentleness, patience. Figure it out how you are going to do that. I am not going to tell you. But you and I, if we are followers of this God, we are called to be compassionate. Not looking at what is fair. There are a million ways you and I can live lives of compassion. Million, not one or two. You get into an Ola taxi, think about how you can be compassionate. Give him a nice 10 or 10, 20 percent tip and say, or give him some money and say, buy some chocolate for your children. When you are in a restaurant and you're not happy with the service they gave, give them a bigger tip. Don't be fair. Figure out how to be gracious, compassionate, because our God is not fair. When you deal with the people who work in your homes or in your factory or wherever you are, be compassionate. Don't be fair. We are called to follow one who is gracious, who is good, who is compassionate. Unlike Inspector Javier who said, the rules don't permit, we don't have to. The gospel allows us and the Holy Spirit empowers us to be generous and compassionate.